Minus 15. Respect all, fear none. Into the upper deck. Intensity is not a perfect. Oh, mercy. Five, four, three, two, one. From inside the warehouse at Oriole Park at Camden Yards, it is the Mass and All Access Podcast. Paul Mancano alongside Bobby Blanco, as always. And, of course, Hello. the Mass and All Access Podcast is brought to you by Marymount University. Visit MarymountSaints.com to learn more about our student athletes and programs today. We are live, of course, on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And, of course, you are maybe listening to this after the fact on uh, SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, wherever. So give it a like, give it a five stars, give it a review, all that good stuff. Uh, Bobby, that sounded like a little British accent with the hello. Did it? I didn't mean to. I just meant to say hello to everyone. Uh, But I don't think I can talk like that the entire time. Be pretty <laughs> a little, cheeky. little cockney there. You yeah, know, I'm a big fan of those. Those, are, those crack me up every single time. Right before the mics were hot, uh, you got me onto a Troy McClure yes. Simpsons Yes, and you have a good... good uh, Hi, I'm Troy McClure. Yeah. yeah, so I'm considering doing the Troy McClure voice for this entire, <laughs> entire thing. You, you won't. But then I also had the moment of... Uh, so Troy McClure is, of course, played by Phil Hartman, one of the best SNL actors of all time. Uh-huh. Um, and <laughs> every time uh, my... It, this is a, a thing that my mom does. Every single time we're having a conversation about celebrities, she will somehow turn it into their tragic death. So we could be around like, you know, this is like we're in, in, at a fancy dinner or something and we're having a funny conversation about, you know, like uh, another one is Judy Garland. And mm-hmm. she'll always be like, and we'll be laughing and then she'll be like, you know, they she died tragically. It was just <laughs> terrible. The entire mood of the room just goes oh, way down. thanks, mom. <laughs> um, but I've heard other people's moms do that, so apparently it's a mom thing. Yeah, well, I mean, everyone has that fun fact. That kind of reminds me of, like, uh, and I'm not, that's more of, like, uh, just adding to the conversation, but I, I was thinking of, like, The Office, where they call Oscar the actually guy, because, like, every oh, yeah, he's yeah. like, actually? Yes. And, then like, you know, it's kind of like the know-it-all. I'm not saying her mom's know-it-all, but she's, she's adding no, to yeah. the, the fun fact of it, but it, it's always just, like, a morbid, like, death-related fact, yeah. so it's not that fun. Well, there's uh, a- another thing that my friend talks about, uh, the idea that if you're in public company, you're enjoying a good time with friends, and say some news breaks that's, mm. like, tragic. There is something, an event happened, a, a natural disaster or something. Um, his theory is you shouldn't bring it up. Mm. So, like... You know, maybe you saw it on your phone or something, but you're having a good time. You're out with friends that you shouldn't bring it up because it brings down the mood of everybody yeah. and just changes the entire outlook of it. It's like save it for later. Just don't discuss it. And I think it's an interesting kind of like social thing to see social test to see who does bring it up if they do bring it up. Because that has happened to all of us. We're like somewhere and it's like, oh, did you see there was a, an earthquake and, and, right. and so many people died? It's like that. It, it just changes the entire outlook of, of the evening. Well, I think it's also situational. Like, if yeah. it's something, it's like breaking news. Like, oh, my God, there was an earthquake just hit. Right. Per whatever, name that location. Then it's like, oh, that's, wow, that's that's crazy. But if it's just like, then you keep like adding on. Well, did you also see that like people are dying of cancer? Yeah. <laughs> and or like people are like, it's like, yeah, okay, yes. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. we Yeah, these are things we already know. Like, uh, let's not bring the whole conversation down. We already have some breaking, like, unfortunately, like, you know, it was, I, kind of, I was in that situation kind of a while, like, yesterday, I think it was, because you heard, of, unfortunately, that Ravens fan passed away after the game yeah. on Saturday. Yeah. It's just a tragic situation, but then it's like, everyone's talking, like, it just keeps adding on. It's like, can we not make a bad situation worse? Yeah. Like, by adding on more sad facts to it. Like, <laughs> I guess we want information, but, like, right. let's just keep this guy's f- family in our thoughts for right now and, yeah. and not make it worse than it already is. Yeah, exactly. Um. It's it's always a social test. It always yeah, it is. Really, yeah. Um, so on that tragic uh, <laughs> note, um, but uh, speaking, um, you did bring up the Ravens, and uh, I know there are a lot of fans who are watching and listening to this podcast who uh, are Ravens fans who had a tough weekend. It was it was a rough rough game um, on Saturday. Honestly, did not see it coming at all. Um, they just. Uh, Totally, I mean, the Ravens were totally out of their element. I almost wish that they had lost a, one of their final regular season games so that they could have seen how they could have responded. But just just a tough way to go out. And I expected to be sitting here on this podcast talking about 
how they were making their trip to the AFC Championship game, and there's a potential Super Bowl on the way. Um, and just a, just a tough weekend for Ravens fans. So uh, I feel you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was. Uh, I, I knew a couple Ravens fans, and also a diehard Orioles fan, and uh, and, for, and listener of the of our program, mm-hmm. Nicholas Umo said that. Um, and he said that as soon as the playoff bracket came out, he did not want to play the Titans. Really? And he said the Titans were the one team he did not want to play because the way they play is the way to beat the Ravens. Play really good defense and run the ball. Yeah. Um, I've never seen it. Like, they were like a throwback. I mean, Derrick Henry's team. having an unbelievable post. I mean, he's having a playoff run for the history books yeah. at this point. I mean, 190 yards, like, on the ground is insane. Yeah, and and they're giving him, like, 30 carries a game. Yeah. The teams don't do that anymore. Right. Like, and uh, I think I saw uh, Tannehill only threw the ball, like, 18 times. How is that possible? <laughs> you know, like, that, that you can win an NFL game, a playoff game like that. And have your quarterback barely throw the ball. Yeah. It's it's bizarre. I um also I I mean it's such a tough call, and this is why I'm not an NFL head coach. But I was so worried about you know, Lamar Jackson and the starters had basically three weeks off because they didn't play yeah. week 17, so they didn't really go through the normal prep leading up to week 17. Then you get the bye, and then like you're kind of leading up towards the divisional round, and that's especially for a young quarterback. You, you would I, it's such a tricky line too because if you play in week 17, even for a drive or two. You know, it might not be him, but what if your star gets hurt and then it's like, well, why was he in the game in the first place? You didn't need that game. So it's a tricky line, but having three full weeks off pretty much leading into that game. Um, and then basically the Titans kind of playing playoff football for the past, what, six weeks, just to get yes. into the playoffs. Right. Now they're on a roll. I and mean, it's just kind of like a, a bad matchup for the Ravens, I felt like. Uh, but I mean, yeah. still, they had a fantastic season. That's a. Ravens fans will remember the season forever. Fourteen and two, the eventual MVP in Lamar Jackson. I mean, just a phenomenal yeah. season, and they are so well set up for the future. And uh, you know, it will be kind of a little bit of a sad MVP kind of presentation just because of the way that it it went out. But yeah, I mean, Lamar Jackson was the runaway MVP this entire season, and he just turned twenty three. I mean, so he is yeah. still has such a bright future ahead of him, and you know, he, you you can't really find somebody more motivated um and especially after that loss you have to imagine he's going to be incredibly motivated for next season and they, i think they bring back almost the entire team yeah i think only a handful of them are like pending free agents uh, yeah. so maybe some of the guys they traded for it mid-season but yeah for the most part they've got a really good really good core um holiday brown is i mean not Hol- wait hollywood brown is going Holl- to become yeah. is going to become <laughs> a think young of brian holiday yeah right well which we'll, we'll touch on in a minute mm. but he's becoming a young star he, he's going to be one of their best weapons they probably could add another receiver yeah and i was actually watching with my friend umo i just mentioned the national championship game last night and he was just salivating over those wide receivers playing and between clemson and lsu yeah. he's like i want that one i want that one i yep. want that one <laughs> oh and well it's a they it, add one more deep threat and that offense is going to be really yes. hard to stop they already are yeah but they'll be even harder adding one more guy on the outside exactly and they were such a rushing team that like once they went you know it, they're better playing from a, a, a head you feel like because yeah they can just run the ball as opposed to you know you're down you got to throw the ball and all you have is hollywood brown and a bunch of tight ends um, but yeah, th- this this they'll, they'll get their receiver in this draft class. It's like a loaded that that national championship game was another display of <laughs> the amazing talent that's going to be coming. Oh my gosh, this this draft is going to be ridiculous. Yeah, um, but anyway, we are a baseball podcast, so let's talk some baseball. Uh, the Orioles uh, made a couple additions: one via waiver claim, and then uh, one via a minor league contract. Brian Holiday was the minor league deal. Uh, let's talk about him first. Uh, he is a catcher. We talked about on this podcast a while ago that the main objectives for Michael Elias this offseason uh, were going to be a veteran middle infielder. They checked that bo- box with Iglesias. We mm-hmm. talked about that last week. And uh, getting some pitching, to maybe starting or bullpen. They checked that box as well. And then the last one would be uh, the th- clearly third on the list would be catcher because they're actually okay at catcher. Of course, they have their catcher of the future waiting in the wings, but even for this current team, I mean, they have they have Pedro Severino and they have Chance Sisko, both guys still fairly young, still some promise in those guys, but clearly Michael Elias thought that that was a position that needed to have a, a an established major leaguer um, in the just just as a at least somebody who could give some stability to that position. Yeah, and it was also kind of funny because last week we did a our podcast and we had uh, live comments from from viewers and please comment along throughout the show today too as well um, asking what are the chances that a, uh, there could be a reunion with Matt Weeders and we kind of discussed that briefly yeah but you know th- 
we know that they've been looking for that veteran catcher, um, and it just happened to be Brian Holiday. Um, and yeah, you're right. They're they're set. Chancisco, uh, Pedro Severino. We talked about that again last week. Um, you have those guys kind of holding it down right now. But Michael Elias has mentioned that he wants a veteran guy in here because those guys are young, and they. I mean, you know, we, 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 I feel like Pedro Severino's older than he actually is because we've we covered him from the national side for this first half of his major league career, and now he's with the Orioles. Um, but still a young catcher, still a lot to learn, a lot of improvements can be made both behind the plate and at the plate. Um, you know, Brian Holiday, he's nothing to really be celebrated about, but he's kind of been there, done that. You know, he's been around for a long time, um, a, a former. Uh, High draft pick, a six round draft pick out of uh, TCU with um, the with the Tigers, or excuse me, uh, yeah TCU, sorry, um, and has been around since 2012 uh, and, and and kind of played all, all uh, with a, some good staffs too in Detroit and Boston can catch uh, some good pitchers. So hopefully that's something that he can kind of bring to the table and not not only help these catchers but maybe also these pitchers as well. Yeah, and he's coming off maybe his best year uh, as a pro as well. Only played in 43 games, but uh, hit 278, 344 on base percentage, 779 OPS, which anytime you're around 800 is pretty solid, um, and hit four homers, which for him was a career high. So, uh, you know, clearly not by any stretch one of the better offensive catchers in the game, but he's not going to hit uh, if he if he just maintains that production. You know, he will be able to hold his own um, in the line. He's he's a certainly a better. Um, option than some of the options that they had at this point last year. Yeah. Um, and, you know, obviously they're, they're not looking for him to get um, to start there every day, considering the, the fact that they have those other two guys. But um, similar to the signing with Iglesias, they wanted somebody in this position to be able to help those young pitchers, as you said, Bobby. Mm-hmm. Somebody who can help develop these guys. Somebody who knows how to call a game, knows how to frame, so that he helps you know, them look better, helps their ERAs, um, and and just knows what it takes to be a major league pitcher and what it takes to, to build that relationship. So, um, you know, it, it, it is an important position, I think, for that reason. So he, anything that he brings offensively to the table is is like icing on the cake. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He'll take that just as long as he's provide, And it's, um, you know, just a minor league deal. So it's not even guaranteed he'll be on the major league team. You'll have him f- throughout training camp yeah. um, and spring training um, for, what, the month and a half? Yeah, basically a month and a half. So that's something right there. And pitchers and catchers report, of course, in a, week, a month from today, uh, the 14th or, or like the 13th, something like that. So, yeah, it's going to be a good guy to have in your building from the get-go. It's not like you're bringing him in mid-spring training or – early on in the season, like in April or May, to kind of help out. No, he'll be there from day one. You get the pitchers down there. You get the rest of your young catchers down there. And he's hopefully kind of giving them pointers here and there of how to, you know, call a game, learning at the staff, learning what they like to throw. Maybe it can keep, uh, give out some pointers on how they can improve too. And, and like, you know, maybe if you just want to locate better here, something like that. So, yeah, it's definitely a good body to have in the building in terms of just – having a veteran presence behind the play because that's something that, like you said, they tried to do last year with guys like Jose Sucre didn't really work out. Jesus, Jesus, mm-hmm. Jesus Sucre. It didn't really work out the way they kind of envisioned it. And hopefully, yeah. it, and, and again, minor league deal, nothing definite. You know, he's not going to be, I mean, he might, but he probably won't be like a staple throughout the whole season. Yeah. But just another guy in the building right now to kind of help out and dish out pointers. Maybe right. Basically he's like a, a, a player coach. Yeah, you know, he's kind of going to be like come in and help coach coach up the young guys. Obviously, participating, he's going to be wanted making the major league roster, but just another voice in like the the room to, to for for these young guys. Yeah, absolutely, and they could always use that. Um, and then the other addition that they made, in addition to Brian Holiday, somebody that they claimed off of waivers, Richard Urania, who is still fairly young. He turns twenty four next month. Um, see, he has only played in three major league seasons. Never played more than forty games. Um, but he has a solid 200, uh, 253 average, rather, uh, just two career homers in 91 career games. But um, his main staple, si- similar to Iglesias, is um, defense and defensive versatility. Um, uh, he can play pretty much all over the diamond, shortstop, second base, third base. Um, he has played at a major league level. So just another guy, I think, to throw in this infield mix. Yeah, and it's 
he's kind of be playing that maybe that utility role too. Like you said, he kind of plays all across the diamond, has vers- versatility. He played primarily shortstop in the minor league system uh, with the Blue Jays last season. Um, so maybe your backup shortstop, maybe an emergency shortstop. Again, this maybe also creates some friendly competition with Richie Martin, but also doesn't put too much pressure on him to be the guy that, you know, that needs to break camp with the team um, and be on the opening day roster. Uh, he can stay in the minor leagues and, and continue to progress. It's just another guy, uh, like you said, just to kind of create that competition. I think I, that's good because, you know, Iglesias is going to be your starter out the gate. Uh, Richie Martin obviously is going to be in the major league camp to start off spring training, but you would hope that, you know, he's still battling for uh, a position. You know, he obviously stayed up in the major leagues all last season out of necessity, but, you know, still here played pretty much every day. Um, so, but yeah, versatility across the diamond can play your backup, maybe emergency shortstop if needed. Um, offense, not quite there. Uh, 253 is not fantastic last year. Power numbers aren't really there, yeah, but like you said, pop, I think. but like you said, defense is the primary reason he's here. Um, and I don't know, just kind of maybe, I, I like the sense of creating it like in a camp like this, like, cause like we said last year, last week when we talked about how now Iglesias is probably the, you know the one true starter we know on this lineup, but then add Trey Mancini, maybe, maybe Chris Davis, we don't, and maybe uh, Severino behind the plate, but we don't really know where other guys are going to slot in in terms of how they're going to start in the starting lineup in the, in the infield. So I think with a young team like this going into spring training, add competition, you know, just create, like they kind of did last year with the two rule five gra- draft guys, just, you know, Make someone go out there and earn a spot on this team because it's a wide open roster and and you know this is a place of opportunity for players who want to rejuvenate their career, want to start jump start their career. You know it's going to be a free for all come spring training once the position players arrive. Um, so it's just another guy to kind of create that comp- comp- competitive environment. Yeah, absolutely. And and I look at him almost you know different position, but similar to a Dwight Smith Jr. Uh, mm. signing last year. Another guy that they picked up. Uh, in the, after the new year had turned, fairly close to pitchers and catchers reporting. Um, somebody who had had a, a taste of major league experience, showed some tools, uh, and was still pretty young, but had never gotten an opportunity to start every day. Comes to the Orioles, gets an opportunity to start every day in the outfield, and starts out blazing hot. He yeah. slowed down as the season went along, and part of that could have been due to the concussion, the other injuries, uh, that Dwight Smith Jr. suffered, but we saw his best uh, uh, year as a pro, and I think we saw more than we were maybe expecting from him uh, when they added him. In Richard Urania, I think you can see a similar type model. Somebody who just needs, uh, you know, still fairly young, is going to get an opportunity potentially, if he earns it, uh, to maybe start every day in, a, in an infield spot, um, and somebody who has still has a lot of potential uh, in that in that area. So I, I see him similar in a similar mold to Dwight Smith Jr. The one thing though, that might be kind of hindering him or mm-hmm. might be a cause for concern. He is out of minor league options. Yeah. According to Rocco So, you know, he's, if he makes some major league club, all power to you. But if you don't continue to earn your way on this roster, you're going to be placed on waivers because you can't be optioned down to the minor leagues. Whereas of course, Richie Martin does have options moving forward. So that's going to be something that's going to be a little maybe tricky for Mike Elias and Brandon Hyde when it comes to it, um, you know, when it comes to possibly keeping one or the other, other, you know, it might be tough luck for Arania because he's out of options. They might as well maybe just have to cut him instead. Yeah. Um, it's going to be tough to keep him within the organization if he's not on the major league roster for a majority of the season. Exactly. So with Urania now added to the fold, of course, Jose Iglesias being added a, a couple weeks ago. It improves the infield, but also raises some questions about where some guys might slot, slot into some spots. So we talked about last week where what our ideal kind of starting infield would be. To you, Bobby, does the addition of Urania kind of change where you think you would put guys if the season were to start today? Put guys sorry, in the infield. In the infield. Um, no, I don't think so. I, 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 I mean, he's only played... I'm looking at his game logs. Like he's never played more than 40 games in in the major leagues in a season. Yeah, the one year he did was 2018, and he actually hit 293, his best average overall. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that could be due to volume. You know, he had 
108 plate appearances. Is, that's his, by far his highest in his major league career as well. So he doesn't have that longevity experience like some of these other guys have. Iglesias slotting at short. I think Hanser Alberto, I mean, again, this is, might be tr- tricky where we don't know exactly where Brandon Hyde is going to place them because Hanser Alberto could move over to third. But I think he has earned a quote-unquote starting job. Not sure where, but he'll be a starter. Yeah. P- could probably say the same with Rio Ruiz at third. Uh, we, of course, talked about this last week as well. But, again, maybe just the longevity of he's more of an established major leaguer than Urania at this point. Um, he, he might have to really fight and battle. Like, it would take a really good, really, really crazy good spring training for him to kind of work his way onto not just the roster, but into kind of a starting role. Yeah. And, um, yeah, he just as an infielder, too. He doesn't really have any versatility in yeah. where you could pop him in a corner outfield slot in, that, in, yeah. in, a, in a pinch. That's the thing, though. We saw this team kind of find a spot for a Stevie Wilkerson. Right. Considering he had never played at the major league level, had never played the outfield before, and all of a sudden he was starting every day in center field. Yeah. Um, and, sh- and flashed some at, at least leaping ability. Um, Perhaps recklessly at times. He does have, uh, it looks like he does have a, a, at least an appearance in left field last year with the Blue Jays. Okay. So that's 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 not nothing. Yeah, it's not nothing. He's he's tested those waters before. Yeah. But yeah, again, I think from the way the roster is already constructed, some of the incumbents from last season have mm-hmm. already been here and established that, you know, they've... For you know, again, this could all change. You know, if Hans Alberto all of a sudden just comes in and can't hit worth anything, yeah, I don't foresee that happening. But you know, just for the sake of argument, then yeah, he can wiggle his way on here. But I think they have guys already here that that they're trusting that can can fill the role for right now. Yeah, and last year and a, a couple months ago, rather, um, I know a lot of Orioles fans were upset by the fact that they traded a Jonathan Br to the Marlins. Um, as, you know, considering he was going at that point projected to make a little bit of over $10 million for next year. The projection was a little bit high. He made about a little more than $8 million for this next season. Mm-hmm. But you look at the deal that they signed with Jose Iglesias. You look at the fact that they signed Richard or Urania. I don't think there's going to be much of a drop off. I think where Iglesias doesn't have the offense. Um, I think that he will make up for it in terms of defense at the shortstop position. And, uh, I think at this point they're still just about as good as they were last year in the infield. Yeah, they're, they are. You know, there is a baseline. They are. I, I don't think that they will take too much of a step back from the infield that they had last year. Right, and and in terms of Iglesias at short, you, you know, I don't think anyone's expecting him to be the Jonathan Villar type and that he's going to play all one sixty two. Right, that, that that's not going to be expectation. So you're probably going to. I'm going to say, you know, obviously health plays a factor in this as well. Let's say he starts 120 games at short. Then you're only filling about 40 games between possibly Urania, Richie Martin. Um, I think Rakobako even mentioned that Hanzo Alberto could play short in a pinch. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sure Rio Ruiz could probably slot there. So like you're piecing together around maybe 40 starts, maybe less uh, at short that aren't Iglesias. So that's not a that's very doable yeah. um, in terms of and, and and in terms of dropping off defensively. Maybe yeah, maybe the offense takes a little bit of a hit. But again, we talked about this last week. Jose Iglesias isn't even brought in here to play offense. He's brought in here to play defense. They have plenty of other bats across the lineup where they can generate offense from. Whoever's going to be filling the shortstop spot might be hitting pretty far down the lineup. Um, so you you could probably fill in those spots where you give Iglesias a day off between these handful of guys. Because, one, like you said, they all play really strong defense, and two, they're all pretty versatile where they can play anywhere. Yeah, exactly. All right, um, moving from infield to starting pitcher, because we are getting a question from Max Godwin on uh, Twitter about the starting pitchers. He said, any young guys who may get an opportunity this year? I think the the two names that stick out to me are the two guys that a couple months ago were added to the 40-man roster. Um, That would be Dean Kramer uh, and Keegan Aiken, two guys that... Uh, one of them, Dean Kramer, got a little bit of a taste of AAA. Keegan Aiken played the majority of the season, the entire season, at AAA Norfolk. Um, those are two guys I think we talked about last week. I think Keegan Aiken may not start. I don't think either is going to start uh, the opening day on this roster. 
Yeah. But I think Keegan Aiken has a good chance to be added to the opening or to the roster in potentially May, June. And I think Dean Kramer, if he has a good uh, first half of the season at AAA Norfolk, could be added to the major league roster maybe after the All Star break. So I, I could see a scenario in which both of those guys at some point in 2020 are making starts for the Orioles. Right. And I think it was either. Um, your sit-down interview with Mike Elias at the winter meetings, or it might have been even the winter warm-up thing that the Orioles hosted here on, at Camden Yards um, last fall. Uh, but Mike Elias, was, he's very high on Keegan Aiken. He, he's looking forward to Keegan Aiken having a pretty big jump this season and, and, and reach have some, some uh, sustained success at mm-hmm. the major league level at some point this year um, and provide – that kind of arm that they're expecting out of him uh, at, the, at the major league level. So, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think he's a guy to keep an eye on. Uh, Kramer is also a really good one. Both guys, again, the pitchers throughout the course of the organization made so many great strides last year in terms of using the analytics um, and, and, and and those camera pitching ca- machines where they can fix their mechanics and, and just the smallest tweaks. We talked to uh, Buck Britton a bunch in the Bay Sox run to the postseason last year, and he just kept mentioning how much all this technology information has helped their pitching staff so, so much. Yeah. And these guys are getting really close probably this year to make that leap to, you know, major league level and major league level success um, at some point. So those are two, I think those are really two good good names to keep an eye on for this season. Just because of the strides they made last year, you would expect they would make equal strides this year. Exactly. And beyond 2020, there are, of course, several options High end options. I mean, the the two guys obviously that that really stick out are the Grayson Rodriguez and DL Hall, mm-hmm. um, that are still at the lower levels of the organization. I think both could potentially get experience at Double A this year. Um, we saw DL Hall at, at Frederick last year, and we saw what uh, Grayson Rodriguez could do at Delmarva. So, two guys that I think potentially um, have top end of the rotation stuff and ability, and are still twenty years old and have that ability to to reach that point eventually. Don't think we'll see either of those guys in 2020. They want to take their time, make sure that they are major league ready before they get their major league opportunity. Um, but, I mean, the fact that you you already have two, maybe two exciting guys in Keegan Aiken and Dean Kramer potentially making their major league debuts this year, and then you have those other two guys waiting in the wings, in, not even to mention a Michael Bauman or somebody of that ilk who still has that potential to, to work his way up. Um, there's a reason that this team consistently, I know a lot of people, you know, look at, uh, at, were maybe upset with the fact they took two pitchers in the World 5 draft, that they're, con- that, that, the, the, the um, uh, Dylan Bundy deal, they got four pitchers back. They are investing heavily, heavily in the organization and pitching. And, you know, we have talked about on this podcast, that's something this organization has not had right. for a long time, is a pipeline of pitchers to come up. So um, I think that is, that, it, that's how you, one one way certainly to build a solid organization is to just continue to refresh that pipeline of pitchers. Yeah, and just add, 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 add. Yeah. Get all the depth you can. And like you said, you, they got basically four for one in the in the, the Dylan Bundy deal. Of course, none of those guys. I think only one of them was a Triple A, had reached a Triple A level before. But still, it's just you're adding to the depth. Um, hopefully, and we said even that pockets, even one of those guys pan out to be like the major league. A staple on this roster. I think they're all mostly relievers. I don't think they got any starters in that Dylan Bundy deal. Maybe one, right? I, I think. I can't really remember. Uh, but anyways, they even just one sticks. It makes it worth it because you're just, at this point, it's, you know, you're not building to you know, win a World Series this year. You're just not. You're building to win a World Series down the line. Um, and you need young, controllable talent that you know have options that are, are, are still on rookie deals that are pre-arbitration um, that once they reach up here you can have them for the the, the best part of their young careers yeah. you know for the long long time and build up that way you look at other teams across the major league baseball that that build up that way are you know they they really focus on pitching and like you said this is something that the Orioles haven't done in a really long time and fans have been wanting to see them do this and, and it's just adding arms adding arms adding arms and see who comes out of it Russell Robbins asking thoughts on Austin Hayes. I think that was one of the brightest spots of the Orioles 2019 season was the emergence of Austin Hayes right at the end of the year. You're asking two really big Austin Hayes fans up here. Austin uh, Hayes stands, if you will. Austin. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Hayes really, um, 
I, I think for a long time we have had our eyes, and, and people who have uh, been following the Orioles minor league system have had their eyes on Austin Hayes because of the fact that he was their minor league player of the year a couple of years ago, the fact that he, he worked his way up to the major leagues two years ago. Um, the fact that he has, he to me, has always had the ability to be a major league player. You know, he has the athleticism. He has the hitting tools, I think, certainly. He can hit for power. He can hit for contact. And then we saw what he can do defensively uh, in center field last year. The biggest question for him coming up through the system ever since he made his Major League debut in 2017, after that it was just a rash of injuries. Yeah. It was just one thing after another. Couldn't get fully healthy. When he did get healthy, he wasn't playing up to his ability. He added some weight. He said that might have hurt him because he was trying to become too much of a power hitter. We saw in 2019, the very end of it, he, when he has all of it together, he can be a very special player um, and a regular major leaguer, and we got just a little bit of a taste of that. Just still got to see that he's healthy, but beyond that, he has the confidence, he has the ability to be a, a solid major leaguer. He's a freak athlete, but uh, yeah. like you said, it's, it's the question of health, and you know he didn't make it back up to the major leagues in 2018 after debuting in 2017. He had a split time that year between Bowie and Aberdeen, playing mostly at Bowie. But like you said, injuries throughout that season kind of derailed his 2018 campaign. Come back last year, had a really good 2019, was all up and down the system, and then obviously breaking through in September with the Orioles and, you know, becoming highlight haze. I mean, he was just, like you said, in the defense in center field, he was unbelievable at times, making crazy catches and plays, hitting four home runs, showing really a lot of flash, a lot of flash. And that's something that Orioles fans are like, really salivating over because yeah. i mean he can be kind of that highlight player that you know could hit a bunch of home runs can make defensive plays in the outfield um he's definitely something to look forward to and like i i agree i think it's a matter of him can he stay healthy he'll break camp with the team i'm, I'm pretty sure um he could be your opening day starting center fielder um basically taking over the role from cedric mullins from a year ago uh can he stay healthy and stay productive um you know, hopefully he worked on his offense this offseason. We'll see how his bat looks when we get down to Sarasota. Uh, but the defense should stay there because he, he was playing plus defense out there yeah. for all of September. And that center fielder is not easy because you are covering way more ground than either of the, of the corner outfielders. So, yeah, um, yeah he, he's a, uh, he has really high hopes. He's, you know, if I'm making a list of things I'm looking forward to this season, he's probably near the top. And – you mentioned Cedric Mullins' name, and I think it was kind of a disappointment how slowly he started the season and the fact that he went all the way down to Bowie and was never able to work his way back up. I think Austin Hayes helped mitigate that kind of disappointment that was there for Cedric Mullins. Yeah. Um, because Cedric Mullins, in 2018, showed some flashes in center field. There were certainly some signs of growth, um, but then kind of regressed a little bit. I think Hayes has the ability to improve, if anything. And I think, um, you know, Cedric Mullins, he's... He still has the questions about his size. He still is fairly slight. Um, and, you know, while he has speed, there are still concerns about his ability to be a major leaguer, just considering how undersized he is. Yeah. Um, but I think Hayes has better hit tools. I think he has um, better potential in center field. Um, he has a little bit of speed. So I think that, at, uh, you know, I, I don't envision a kind of drop-off like what we saw from Cedric Mullins from Austin Hayes this year. He's also a third-round draft pick. I mean, you want your third-round draft picks to start breaking through into the major leagues around this time. You know, this would be his third season in the major leagues. Um, and this is – I mean, I know, obviously, it's a rebuilding team. It's a young roster. There's a lot more opportunity. You know, if he were in any other, you know, competing organization, he might not be breaking through just yet. But, you know, as a team that drafted him in the third round back in 2016, you want – this is the kind of the time frame you probably were envisioning – and Austin Hayes, when you drafted yeah. him, it's like, this is 2019, 2020. These are the years down the line that you would hope that he would break through as such a high draft pick. John Freem asking, will Mount Castle make the team out of spring training? Ooh. If I had to guess right now, I would probably say no. Touch on this last week, too. It, it's, it's, he's, he's kind of blocked. It's not, I don't think it's a, a, uh, an issue of him not being talented enough. I mean, obviously, he was the Orioles minor league player of the year last year. He was the Eastern League. Was it Eastern League? Uh, the, he was the, his league's MVP last year. Had a phenomenal season at AAA. The Eastern, or the, um, yeah. It's whatever. not the Eastern yeah. League. Uh, Bowie's Eastern League, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I don't forget what Norfolk is. But he was that league's MVP um, with the Tides. I, I think it's just a matter of where where do you play him. We talked about, again, like we said, I said, we talked about this last week. 
Is he a DH? Well, you don't really want to bring up him just a DH. Uh, you want him playing every day. Yep. And then you also have, you know, a Renato Nunez sitting in that spot. Maybe a Chris Davis. Chris Davis is also maybe blocking first. Is Trey Mancini going to be playing first at all this season? Or is he going to be more of a right fielder? Uh, can he slot it? I don't think his glove is ready to play third base no. at the major league level. Even so, I think that, like we just talked about with the depth of the infielders that the Orioles now have, they've got probably four guys that they would rather put over there than Ryan Mountcastle. So it's not a – I'm going to say no, he's not going to break camp with the team. We'll see him up for sure this year. But it's not a case of him not being talented enough. It's just a case that there are now maybe yeah. too many bodies blocking his way up here. And, and in terms of the position he plays. In terms of his offense ability, there's nothing else you need to see. I mean, they they – said yes last year we would like to see him walk more it was almost a little bit nick picky because of how excellent he was he was over 300 at the plate i think he hit 25 homers last year um you know and and still walked at an okay rate it's not like he had a a terrible on base percentage so you know they do maybe that is a one slight concern but the majority of his concerns are on the defensive end because the offense is absolutely there i think the other question you know is how long are you willing to wait for his defense to develop? Right. Because at this point, he's, what, 23 years old, I believe? He is... He'll be 23 in, in, uh, in February. Okay. So his, his offense is absolutely major league ready. And if you give him the first half of the season and he's still not developing, he still hasn't found his defensive position, can you continue to keep him in the minor leagues? Because... Yeah. You know, at, at some point, you might just have to say, all right, this guy is a DH going forward, mm-hmm. or he can maybe only play first base if we need him out in the field. But at this point, he is major league ready. He is ready to help a team on the offensive end. So let's get him up here. So I think that it's going to be interesting. I think ideally, you know, he starts out the year, maybe he finds his position, whether it's in the outfield, whether it's at first base, third base. And they say, all right, that's where we want him. Um, he's, he's settled in. Now he's major league ready. But if that doesn't happen, at some point they might have to make the decision, all right, we're bringing this guy up as a DH, and anything he gives us on the defensive end is just extra. Yeah, it's the International League. International League, that's right. Um, and, you know, we we have seen notes that offensive numbers were up throughout AAA level last year. Mm-hmm. So that may be That's a good point. Bonus. But, yep. you know, 25 home runs, 83 RBIs, hit 312 with a 344 on base and a 871 ops. I mean, he slugged in 127 games um, uh, for the for the Tide. So, yeah, the bat is definitely there. Steve Molesky has talked about this a lot, too, on MassingSports.com. The bat's never been the question. It's the glove, and it's the where do you play him. Um, yeah. and, and I think you're right. We're getting to the point because he was drafted the year before. We just talked about Austin Hayes being a third-round pick in 2016, kind of getting ready to break through. You would think of that time when uh, Ryan Mackhouse was your first-round pick in 2015. So, He's getting real close. If not, this needs to be the year where he needs to break through. Again, it's not really his fault that he hasn't broken through yet because they have kind of switched him around in terms of his defensive positioning, and there wasn't any need for him, especially early on in his career, for him to be up here uh, or or really have a fast track to the major leagues. You think about, obviously, Manny Machado playing third base for those couple of years, his first couple of years, um, talking about Mountcastle being in the Orioles system. Uh, Chris Davis being at first base. So where do you slot him? You know, if he was an outfielder, this wouldn't be an issue. He would break camp with the team. Yes. Um, but because he plays infield and, and there's an influx of infielders on, on this roster and throughout this organization, it's just going to be tough to f- to fit him up here. But I agree that we're getting close to you might not be able to keep him down there for too much longer because his, yeah. his bet is just going to call for him to be on the major league club. Exactly. Sean Goddard asking, why didn't we resign Jesus Sucre as a backup catcher? Um. He was, I think he was less than what they expected offensively um, at the plate in the 20 games that he did appear with the Orioles. But he was more than expected as a pitcher. He was certainly more. Th- <laughs> That's because there were no expectations of him <laughs> as a pitcher. Um, and then was bumped down to the minor leagues. I don't think he showed enough in the minor leagues to be brought back. Um, I think he hit about 250. Um, still, you know, was never, never really hit for power. Um, and uh, I, I just don't think that they saw enough from him they wanted somebody with a little bit of a, a higher ceiling than Jesus Sucre to bring as a backup veteran catcher. He only hit 210 in the major league level. Yeah. Didn't homer, had three RBIs. I mean, that's just, you can't play that. Even right. as a catcher, when you're playing maybe every other day, you're splitting time usually. You can't play that at, at, uh, up here, um, even for a team that's going through a rebuild like the Orioles. And then down in the minors, 
uh, for Norfolk. He hit 283, which is is pretty solid. But then again, you know, he is – how old is he? He's 31. Yeah. So he should be doing that. You know, it's yeah. – it's, and like we just mentioned how uh, AAA numbers were kind of elevated last year anyways. Yeah. So it's – yeah, I don't – I think you're I right. He also didn't uh homer in the triple A level either. So yeah, I think you're right. He was they had he didn't reach expectations. That's the, yeah. basically the bottom line. They thought he would be a lot more productive offensively. Um never never got close and they just couldn't hold on too much to him any yeah. longer. Robert Sullivan asking on YouTube about uh Chris Davis and their plan for him this year. I think we saw a little bit of it. It was Brandon Hyde and Mike Elias's first year, obviously, in the Orioles organization, their first year working with Chris Davis. Down in the winter meetings, uh, we talked to Mike Elias about it. He said he had been in contact uh, with Scott Boris, who, of course, represents Chris Davis. Uh, Scott Boris also met with the media and got a question about Chris Davis. He said that uh, it's always a concern when somebody's not meeting the expectations of a contract that they sign. Um, but Elias also said we are in contact with Chris. He is working about once a month. They check in with him. Um, he wouldn't get into the specifics about um, the various changes he was making to a swing, the various swing doctors that he was going to. Um, but we heard at the end of the season as well that, you know, Elias said he is going to be on this roster come 2020. Mm -hmm. So you, you take all of the pieces of that together. He is definitely going to be on this roster. Mm -hmm. The question is, how much is he going to start? I, I, I think we can, we said at this point last year, he has to be better than he was in 2017 or 2018, um, just by nature of that. 2019, he was better, but only slightly. 179 average, hit just 12 homers, played in 105 games. So how much are we going to see of Chris Davis in 2020, and how much better can he possibly be? You know, how, how, what expectations should we have for his improvement? I think Chris Davis has a high bar in himself because of what we've seen he can do. And that's what makes this so frustrating. We've seen what he can do. I mean, with those seasons hitting 50 plus home runs. Um, and I remember saying when they signed him to that extension that off all those off seasons ago, you know, you know, you, sh well, I thought you knew what you were getting. He's going to hit a bunch of homers, but he's going to strike out a bunch too. So, you know, if he's, you know, hitting around 30, 35 home runs a season, I think you take that. Uh, I mean, it, as long as it's not, you know, what was it, hitting 210? Yeah. Well, the problem is he hasn't hit more than si uh, 16 since 2017. Right. And he hasn't hit more than 26 since 2016. Okay. So, yeah. So, I would say, you know, his, all right, let's put his boom then at like 35. You know, if he's hitting around 30 home runs a season, like what Chris – Trey Mancini hit 36 last year, 35. So if he can kind of match that, I think you'll take that as an Orioles fan, especially considering where his he, where he has been the past couple of seasons. Um, maybe around like you know 80 or 90 RBIs. I think 100 might be really grasping there. But also don't forget, he's played really good first base defensively. Um, he's probably the best defensive first baseman they have on this roster. So if you're getting just some kind of offensive production where he's hitting the long ball, he's hitting, you know, I don't want to get put too high of a lofty expectations, but like around 250, 240. I mean, it's just, I, he had such a high that bar, a then he signed and then his bar dropped so low. So we talked about this too. It's just, you know, anything that's an improvement you'll take at this yeah. point because he is eating so much money um, on this roster and he has so much expectations and you've seen what he can do. Right. It's just a matter of, Where's the middle ground? Yeah, and I, I, I think the other question is, is he going to get that opportunity? Because, you know, they, he, he, we know that he's going to be on this roster, but how often is he going to start? He started over 100 games last year, or played in 100 games last year, um, but, you know, if, if is the, the leash might be even shorter, Brandon Hyde's leash on Chris Davis might be even shorter. He might play in only 85 games, so he, he might not get the opportunity. Well, then also, I mean, we just talked about Mountcastle. I mean, maybe Mountcastle is kind of, you know, it could be a a dual thing right there where Mountcastle is forcing his way on the roster and Chris Davis is playing himself out off yeah. the starting lineup. So, And it's, we've seen him do that, and Brandon Hyde is not shy of benching him. Yeah. You know, and, you know like Brandon Hyde and Michael Eyes, obviously he's on the roster. They want him to see him do well, but – 
they, they didn't sign him to this extension. They're not tied to Chris Davis, and um, we're on the latter half of this that contract anyway, so they're m- not that determined to make sure he turns it around and it becomes a staple for this team down the future. If he's not playing up to snuff, they'll bench him. Exactly. And, and they'll put someone else out there, um, exactly. i.e. a Mount Castle. So. so there are a lot of uh, a lot of questions to address this off season as we get ready. Less than a month until uh, pitchers and catchers report to spring training down in Sarasota, Florida. So keep your co- questions, comments coming all off season. We will have podcasts every week from now until report time in Sarasota. Uh, he is, of course, is Bobby Blanco at Bobby underscore Blanco on Twitter. I'm at Paul Mancano on Twitter. Mass and All Access podcast is brought to you by Marymount University. Visit MarymountSaints.com to learn more about our student athletes and programs today. Thank you to Amy Jennings behind the scenes running the podcast. We will be back in a week. Thank you guys for joining us so much. We'll see you later.